Our keynote address for the conference is by Carlos Braceras. His uh, remarks were pre-recorded. Carlos Braceras is the executive director of the Utah Department of Transportation and is responsible for the design, construction, and maintenance of Utah's 6,000-mile system of roads and highways. He is the executive board chair at Transportation Research Board, as well as the AASHTO Board of Directors. He previously chaired the Subcommittee on Maintenance. It's such a pleasure to be able to return to the National Pavement Preservation Conference again for what I hope will be a riveting keynote uh, speech on pavements. Um, well, I promise that I'll talk a little bit more than um, as one of our coworkers said about gluing rocks together, um, but I'll talk a little bit about what this means to uh, our industry and transportation. Well, I know that meeting together over Zoom or Google Meets has become kind of the norm for a lot of us. I have to say, I really miss attending these events in person. You know, meeting people and vendors is always one of my favorite things to do at these conferences, learning about all the greatest um, and latest projects and innovations in our industry has always been an inspiration for me uh, throughout my entire career. All of these individuals with their unique talents all make a contribution to make big things possible. Roads and bridges. But I want to take a moment to talk about something even bigger than that. So sometimes I always ask myself, why am I here? Well, you may be asking yourself that same question. And really, we're here to learn. And maybe if we're lucky, I'll even provide a little entertainment. But frankly, you're not going to learn a lot about pavement from me. I'm not going to teach you about gluing rocks together or anything technical, believe me. We're here because we care and we want to serve the public. We want to do something really meaningful. I fundamentally believe that every one of us is here today, deep down, we want to make the world a better place. And I'll bet everyone here you're probably a little frustrated. You have a massive transportation system to take care of. But here's what you don't have. You don't have the money. You don't have enough people. You don't have enough time. And in those times of feeling frustrated, you always go, need to go back to the why. You need to understand why it's so important, the work you do. People don't care if you have a soft spot in the pavement or if it lasts for seven years or 10 years. They don't care about your pavement health index. They just don't want to hit a pothole. They don't want you to waste their money. The why is giving people what they do care about. They care about getting home in time for dinner with their family. They care that their kids can get safely to school on the school bus. They care about finding a good job and being able to get to those jobs. We're here because we improve the quality of life for all of our citizens. But let's start with a little history. The story of humankind's achievements wouldn't be complete without reflecting on how far our transportation and infrastructure systems have come. Nearly 30,000 years ago, humans began to congregate in large groups, forming complex societies that engaged in the exchange of ideas, agriculture, and trade. To survive and thrive, it was necessary for us to cooperate and build large public works projects to support the growing populations. Some of you may be familiar with the term, all roads lead to Rome. The origin, origin of that phrase is a testament to the ingenuity and the legacy of ancient Roman Empire's expansive roadway network. At the peak, the Romans had built approximately 250,000 miles of roadway networks etched into the landscape from Northern England to Egypt and to Northern Africa, and all the way to Turkey. <coughs> To put some things in perspective, our interstate highway system today is just shy of 47,000 miles. On the main arterial roadways, engineers of the time were pioneering road surface materials methods using concrete mixtures of gravel, volcanic ash, and lime. Not only were they durable, they considered smoothness and how well they would hold up to weather conditions and flooding. Kind of sounds familiar to the way we think about our pavements today, doesn't it? Rome's uh, transportation network was a catalyst for new levels of prosperity and innovation, unlike any civilization has experienced before. People exchanged ideas, innovations, and knowledge. Industries and commerce flourished and established trade routes. Public works projects, such as their 
aqueduct systems could be developed thanks to a reliable network of roads that delivered project materials. And even to this day, you can still see those engineering marvels as they are just as essential to local communities today as they were then. This became really evident to me several years ago. Now, I am not great at being a tourist, and my wife had always wanted to go to Europe, and I never wanted to go and walk through museums. And she came to me one day, she said, what if we brought our bicycles? And so she came up with this idea where there was a company that would move our luggage every day, and we would ride our bicycles from town to town, and our luggage would be there uh, when we showed up. Riding my bike in France, and we spent a week there. At lunch in a small cafe, and I remember the owner, a young lady, mentioning how they had been experiencing a drought, but they were able to benefit from the ancient Roman aqueducts to survive in this tiny town. To this day, they were living off the foresight and the legacy of the Roman Empire's infrastructure projects. Now, I think a lot about those ancient infrastructure marvels, how important they were in maintaining quality of life in both the past and the present. I also thought about how far along we have come in the way we travel and how we've adapted new ideas and challenges. Now, since the Roman times, the horse was the most popular method of transportation, and it was that way up until the 1800s. And during that time, the United States was going through a considerable period of growth. Industrial manufacturing was churning, populations were increasing from rural folks and immigrants making their way to the growing urban cities. And as we all know, with bigger cities can come bigger problems. Sanitation, sewage, air pollution, and yes, Horse pollution, lots of it. Horse and buggy was the most common and efficient method of transportation during that time. But if you've ever been around horses, well, let's just say that no air freshener can, uh, air freshener tree can fix that situation. In a single day, a horse can produce between 15 and 35 pounds of manure, and not to mention other waste, and the numbers of flies carrying disease. In 1894, the Times of London famously estimated that if society continued to rely on the horse and buggy, um, that, quote, in 50 years, every street in London would be buried under nine feet of manure. An individual in New York City dramatically predicted that horse manure would pile three stories high in due time. It's no surprise that many were pessimistic about the unpleasant state of transportation in some places, like New York where there would be nearly 100,000 horses that roam the streets, producing 2.5 million pounds of horse manure a day. Did you ever think we'd be doing calculations such as this at a pavement conference? Now, on top of that, uh, using horses was extremely slow and time-consuming. And on a good day, you could travel anywhere between 10 and 20 miles. But if a road or weather conditions weren't favorable, it could take much longer and create dangerous situations. Take, for example, the Donna Reed Party who became snowbound in the Sierra Nevada mountain range and had to go to pretty extreme lengths to survive, if you know what I'm talking about. And if that isn't enough to remind us to be grateful for our modern roadway system and to invest in them, I don't know what will. Luckily, for a society that was tied to the horse and buggy, a new innovation was being perfected by Henry Ford, a couple hundred miles away from New York City in Detroit, the motor vehicle. In the early 1900s, the Model T made its introduction into American history, transforming mobility and the quality of life at the turn of the century. By 1913, the first cars were starting to gain traction in cities across the country. Just take a look at these two pictures side by side. The one on the left, Easter morning, 1900, Fifth Avenue, New York City. I know that area well. And in the red circle, you can see that one automobile driving in a sea of horse-drawn carriages. In the photo to the right, the same Fifth Avenue, the year 1913, not a single horse in sight. That's how quickly the innovation of the motor vehicle was taking flight. But as societies and industries became more reliant on the car, it was common in infrastructure circles at the time to say, get America out of the mud. Unpaved dirt roads were still common and proved to be a nuisance for individuals on, mo on motor vehicles and on bicycles and a growing economy that was reliant on the efficient transfer of goods across our entire country. States and government and the private sector had to think about how to make an efficient, cost-effective roadway system. Cars and motor-powered machinery were becoming more common and accessible, quickly speeding up mobility and the ability to deliver projects. 
Engineers were experimenting with pavements and asphalt mixtures, and the projects being developed were having profound effects in communities everywhere. Just take a look at these pavement construction projects from the Utah State Road Commission, the fourth biennial report published in 1916. Back then, temporary bridge work and culvert repair cost $35 a mile, and road and bridge inspections were estimated a little over $7 per mile. They bragged about using the latest and most efficient methods of concrete to construct 37 miles of state roads, amounting to about 370,000 square yards of surfacing. Now that was quite a feat for their time. These investments in our roads would go on to change the American landscape and the communities for generations. Now at a few years ago at our annual conference, our deputy director Terry Newell shared a very personal story about how paved roads changed her family's story and trajectory forever. I'm gonna let you hear directly from Terry. Okay, I just want to start out by saying this is not a picture of me because most of you are never going to see me in a dress in my lifetime. So anyway, this is a picture of my grandma Vivian and she was born on a small farm in central Iowa in 1920. She celebrated her 98th birthday on Sunday and incredible that she's been alive for nearly a century and in that time, I thought I would reflect back over that and be able to tell you all these stories about how she had seen the technology for transportation change in her lifetime. But what I actually found out was the technology for transportation didn't change that much. So let's take a look at what was going on with transportation in 1920 in the year she was born. We had, we had um, freight, or we had um, passenger rail, that was making its way between communities, we had electric streetcar that allowed people to move within a community, as well as we had biking and walking. We had airplanes that were, in 1920 in Iowa, hauling freight. And the part of it that surprised me the most was when we start to look at automobile travel. And by 1920 in Iowa, 30% of the households or the families already owned a vehicle. And of the manufacturers who were making cars at that point in time, seven of those are still making vehicles today. And while the look and feel of those vehicles may have changed, the technology behind them really hasn't. We're still using the internal combustion engine. So you look at the transportation technology didn't change a whole lot, but I'd like to make the case that there were a lot of things that changed in my grandmother's life in regards to transportation, and it had a big effect on her life. So let me continue with her story a little bit. So my grandmother, um, when she was 16, she left the farm and she moved into town with her older sister, and they moved into the town of Tama, Iowa. And let me just give you a little bit of history on that because I think it's interesting. If you look across the, the bottom of uh, south end of town here, you see a, a big rail system. And this, this map was actually from the year my grandmother was born. So what, what happened with the, how the, a lot of the small towns developed in Iowa was really based around transportation. But in those days, it was based around the rail system. So Tama was founded during the Civil War, and that was really the, the decade or two before that is when you really started to see rail expand across the state of Iowa. And that expansion continued up until about the year my grandmother was born in 1920. And about that year, you, you had 10,000 miles of track going across the state of Iowa. That may seem like a lot of, of rail transportation, but if you think about the economy in Iowa, it was mainly in those years based around farming. So trying to get produce and livestock to market, it was important to have a really good rail network so you could get that freight to market. So by the time my grandmother was born, that was about the end of that expansion, and you started to see more of a switch over to automobiles and highways. But part of the rail um, locating where it did, you, I have an arrow pointing to where Main Street was. And you start to see a Main Street like this that developed near the rail line. And like many small towns all over the place, these buildings are still there today. So that just gives you kind of a little bit of a look and feel of Tama. So I'll continue on with my grandma's story. 
When she was 18, she married my grandpa. And when she was 19, she had my dad. And that's a picture of her holding my dad. And if you look at the house that's in the background on this photo, that house is where my grandpa was born. They, my grandparents were renting that house, and eventually they saved up enough money to buy the house, and my grandmother lived in that house for the next 75 years. So this was located south of the tracks. You might say the wrong side of the tracks but it was located very close to the railroad. And I, there's some good things and bad things about that. And when I was a kid and I used to spend the night at my grandparents' house, I remember waking up in the middle of the night, sitting up in bed because a freight train would be coming through town about 70 miles an hour, and they'd blow on that horn as they came through town. So I have, I have really strong memories about trains. Um, but then one of the good things about it is that my grandparents also lived close to what we called Uptown Tama. So when I would stay with them, I could walk uptown with my grandma, and she would take me to the meat market uptown, and she'd let me pick out bologna and hot dogs that my mom wouldn't let me have. Um, now when my grandpa took us into town, he would take us to the bakery, and he'd let us get donuts, and then he'd have us go down the street to the shoe store, and he'd buy us grasshoppers. For my grandpa, that meant tennis shoes. So we transitioned in this area from an existence based on rail to what you see further north on the map is the Lincoln Highway. That was really the transition to more of automobile usage. And if you look at the picture I have on the, the east side of town, that's one of the first bridges in Iowa on the Lincoln Highway. And this is a picture of that bridge. And I think it's important for a couple of reasons. The community understood the importance of that transition from rail and going to automobiles, so they wanted to make sure that they had a place on the Lincoln Highway. This bridge was built with private funding from the community prior to the alignment being identified. So they took a chance, built the bridge, put the name Lincoln Highway on it with the hope that the Lincoln Highway would go through their town. So it was pretty strategic on their part. And I'll say another thing um, with this picture that's important for me personally, I was the youngest in my family, and when we were traveling to Grandma's house, we traveled down the Lincoln Highway to get to their town. And I was always the one in the back seat saying, are we almost there yet? Anybody who's got kids knows that happens, right? Are we almost there? And as soon as we got to this bridge, I knew that we were just a few blocks from Grandma and Grandpa's house. So this is a bridge on the National Historic Register. It's still in place today and looks very much like that today. So now let's just talk a little bit more about how Lincoln Highway ties to um, my grandparents' story. This is a picture of my Grandpa Lionel, and he's holding my dad in his lap. And this is from 1940. And in the 1940 census, my grandpa was listed as a chicken feeder. I kind of looked at that and was like, chicken feeder? I'm going to assume that's not a real high-paying job. So his ability to try to take care of his family, and at that point, he was married to my grandma, he had my dad, he also had his widowed mother, my great-grandmother, living with him. So his ability to take care of the family was based on his access to jobs. In a town of Tama, which was less than 3,000 people, the number of jobs he had access to was not very great. So that, that's something that was important for his life, is having access to jobs that existed beyond Tama. So now this picture is on the Lincoln Highway in 1920, the year my grandmother was born. Now I would not call that a reliable transportation system. Because in Iowa, any time it rained, you were not going to be traveling very easily. So for my grandpa, Lincoln Highway was not a help until there started to be one of the big changes that I think there was in transportation during that time. And this is for you, Linda. It was the way we funded our transportation system. So we started to think about, instead of just doing private funding, raising private funds to pave a roadway, we started thinking about things like a federal gas tax and a way to fund a system so that we could put the good planning into it and strategically get a route clear across the country. So at some point, the Lincoln Highway became paved, and it was around in the 30s. 
So what that meant for my grandparents was this happens to be an image of my, um, the first car that my grandpa ever owned. It happens to be a 1928 Chevrolet sedan. I verified that fact with my dad. I wouldn't have known that otherwise. Um, but that was the type of car that my grandpa had. And the fact that he was able to buy that car and the Lincoln Highway became paved as a reliable source of transportation allowed him to get a job in Marshalltown. Marshalltown happens to be 30 miles away from Tama on the Lincoln Highway, of course. So he worked in the Marshalltown Trowel Factory for the next 35 years, and I'm going to tell you that that changed the quality of life for my grandparents. Terry's family story is one of many whose lives were changed thanks to investing in our roadway networks. The benefits were crystal clear, more access to opportunity and prosperity. New and existing industries were supporting economic development and innovation, and we were on the cusp of something so much bigger than ourselves. In 1956, President Eisenhower signed what was then the largest public works pro program in American history, the Interstate Act. And over the course of 10 years and a whopping $25 billion in funding, that would be used to support construction of the interstate highways across the coming decade. According to the book, On the Move, Transportation and the American Story, a book by Janet Davidson and Michael Sweeney, the interstate highway system wound a key and then released a perpetual motion machine. Americans were just as eager to finish road projects as they were to drive on them. A reliable, connected interstate system reduced travel times in both urban areas and in rural areas. There was an increase in freight and a development of regional and international trade hubs access to new neighborhoods and jobs. America was on the move and we began to experience unprecedented economic growth, much in part to the development of the interstate highway system. Today, we have those that envisioned it and built it to thank, because their transportation networks that we have opened the doors wide for opportunity and a better quality of life. Citizens entrusted their tax dollars to us and it was a public investment and we needed to be good stewards by building trust and taking care of what they did and left for us. In 1977, UDOT completed a research study that showed that maintaining roads in good condition was more economical. It seems like common sense. The department determined at the time that it would be fiscally prudent to maintain the system at or above the current conditions, which included a percentage of roads in good, fair, and in poor condition. And we began to adopt a philosophy of good roads cost less. And we, try, we strive to get as much value as possible out of our assets. So we don't burden first future generations with unnecessary debt. It was instrumental in helping us build trust with both the public and elected officials. And without it, we probably wouldn't have been able to take the step up to one of the biggest challenges our state has ever faced. I'm talking about preparing for the 2002 Winter Olympics. We think about our assets that way because it's the right thing to do. The public expects us to use tax dollars in the best way possible. Because after all, we are the experts. And we're drawn to this industry for many different reasons. And I believe that you in the audience are some of the most passionate people when it comes to taking care of our pavements and our assets. Most of the public flat out expects pavements to be smooth and last forever. In fact, a lot of times it feels like they only notice something when it's not perfect. In 2002, Utah hosted the Winter Olympics, and that meant the entire world had their eyes on us. And if things weren't perfect, people will definitely notice. The opportunity spurred us to push ourselves, to achieve more than we thought we ever could or ever imagined. It also set us up for an asset management approach that we have today. Although we didn't know it at the time, in 1997, we were laser focused on putting our best foot forward and showing off how amazing Utah is. We were united by a sense of pride and urgency to present our state to its full potential. In order to do that, we understood we would have to work together towards a shared goal that was so ambitious, it felt barely within our reach. Now in 1997, we broke ground on the project with the objective to construct 60 miles of interstate, 130 bridges, 30 major system-to-system -system interchanges, all in four years. So we got to work. Each of us had a clear role, and we put forth unprecedented effort because we believed we could deliver the best Olympics the world had ever seen, 
and shape the worldview of us. Now, the goal of the Department of Transportation was clear. Provide the perfect Olympic day. We dreamed it up. We let our imaginations run wild. Now, let me paint you a little picture of what that was like. The sun is shining. We have a cup of hot cocoa in our hands. You're always one foot away from a sparkling clean bathroom whenever you need it. And you never have to wait at a red light on your way to wherever you're going. Freeway traffic moves along without ever tapping on your brakes. Now, we knew we couldn't control all that, but we had some ideas for how we were going to bring this to life. We would reconstruct I-15 in downtown Salt Lake and improve many miles of highway. And it was an all-hands-on-deck type of thing. Everyone wanted to be part of the action. And we took a chance on new ways of doing things if we believed they would outperform the status quo. We embraced our partners in the private sector as being part of the team, knowing our success depended on trust and collaboration. And it paid off. The only way for us to be successful was for us to be propelled into a period of extraordinary innovation and performance. We had proven ourselves to our state and the world, and it was important to continue building that trust by showing that we had a plan moving forward to take care of these new assets. When you're driven by your vision and you realize the only path is an innovative path, you sometimes realize benefits that you did not anticipate. <clears throat> yes, we completed the I-15 project before the Olympics, but we also realized and other benefits and challenges. I always think about the new I-15 project as being similar to getting a new shiny car. When you're thinking about buying one, you consider things like budget and what features do you want, of course. Planning for potential maintenance costs. You may want to get the best possible value out of your purchase so you feel confident that your car will be reliable when you need it. Well, the I-15 design build project was our shiny new car. And the state legislature wanted to make sure that we did all the essential maintenance and tune-ups to keep it in good condition. <clears throat> and our department started thinking about what kind of investment we needed in order to maintain that system and prioritize and plan future investments. And we had to think about how to tell our story to the legislature. It meant using our people who had invested so much of themselves in this project and want to be successful to use every resource available, including technology. So in the spring of 2001, we decided not to execute the maintenance portion of the design build contract. We had worked hard to come up with a plan that reflected the conditions and the trends of our pavements. And when I look back at this, this is something that helped make us successful. We focused on first our largest, most important asset, our pavements. Our pavement assets are worth over $24 billion. And we felt this is where the greatest return needed to be. By applying that focus on one asset, we were able to make faster progress. Through the asset management program, we determined that we didn't have the budget to do all the right treatments on every single road at the right time. We were able to determine that if we did not actively treat over 2,700 center line miles, we would be able to maintain the rest of the roadway system with our philosophy of good roads cost less. We would then react to potholes and pavement failures on this, on the, on this other system. We call them level two roads, but we would not be proactive. The preventative maintenance activities on these lower volume roads um, was something we would have to give up. So we broke our roads down into level one and level two. And we did this in a very public way. It was part of every presentation that we gave to the legislature and the governor. Once they understood the strategy, they understood it was a good business decision in light of the limited resources. So fast forward, 2013, 2014 there all of a sudden became a groundswell to fill the funding hole in transportation, all built around the idea of the lowest ownership cost, the lowest cost of ownership for those, those pavements, and being good stewards for future generations. Now, using the LIDAR data that we collected, we were better able to understand the conditions of our roadways, and we found that the level two roads, those in our rural communities primarily, with less than 1,000 vehicles or 200 trucks per day, we're declining in condition with the current funding levels. Using that data, we were able to show our legislators the different funding level analysis and scenarios and how they would affect the overall condition index. UDOT was able to clearly show that a five cent gas tax increase would improve the overall condition over time and would continue our mantra of good roads cost less. Now with our history of trust and accountability with the legislature, and this refined data and performance measures, we were able to get the five cent 
investment, and effectively manage our assets, both in the present and into the future. Now, more than 20 years ago, I would never have managed, imagined how important the I-15 project or our asset management plan would have become. Because we built the trust with the public sector partners and the legislature, we have a strong foundation. U.S. News and World Report ranked Utah's economy as the best in the country. Now, hands down, I give credit to the positive relationships we have with our stakeholders and the trust that we have nurtured over time. Now, Utah's population is booming. The latest 2021 census results show that our population is now, I know some of you big states, don't roll your eyes at me, is now a whopping 3.28 million. But that's a 7.4% increase over the previous decade. And I can't imagine what Utah's going to look like looking forward into the future. Could you imagine if we didn't invest in our infrastructure and in our roadways in the past? And I'm so grateful for the foresight of our department and those across the country who have consistently preserved our infrastructure um, networks uh, with integrity and trust. I've taken the time to share some history and stories about the past. So I want to shift gears and I want to talk about the future. With so much change happening around us, what does the future look like? And most importantly, how can we step up to the plate and be successful? I think the right way for us to move forward is to think of our work as more than building roads and bridges. It's about improving that quality of life. But it motivates everything we do at UDOT. In fact, we developed a quality of life framework that guides how we develop and deliver our projects across the state. Now that framework includes four dimensions. The first is good health which would be high on anyone's list of life qualities. In this context, good health encompasses both the health of individuals and communities, recognizing the role of active transportation in both mental and physical health. Safety is a critical element of good health, as is the role of transportation in our environment. In my view, good health doesn't just mean being alive, it means being healthy enough to be able to actually enjoy the life we've created. The other dimensions also connect transportation and quality of life. A strong economy recognizes the vital role transportation plays in business and in commerce. Better mobility refers to our tr traditional transportation objectives to move people and goods and to reduce delay. And connected communities points to the correlation of transportation and land use, as, as well as the need for intermodal connections between walking, biking, transit, and vehicle travel. Now this quality of life framework identifies specific aspects and creates a shared language that we can use when we collaborate with our partners. But the framework is also broad and that was intentional because it's not our place to tell communities specifically how to envision the communities of their dreams. There is no one right formula for how individual communities should value or balance each of these four dimensions of health, mobility, economy, and connected communities. <clears throat> but when we help communities tailor projects based on what's right for them, we can make positive changes in the world in which we and our families all live. They're gonna drive what kind of projects we pick and the kinds of conversations we have with local communities. And it's critical that we get input from those that we serve. Now with our ear to the ground, there's so much we can learn from each other that can help us deliver better projects and to become better people. You know, about 20 years ago, we all started talking about something we called context-sensitive solutions. It was a theoretical and a practical approach to transportation decision-making and design that takes into consideration the communities and the lands in which the streets, roads, and highways pass. I always felt the most important part of CSS was that first, first word, context. And context is always provided by the community. It's not our job to tell our partners what constitutes the community of their dreams. It's our job to listen, to learn, to understand, and to respond within the bounds of our role. I look at some of the communities we worked with decades ago, and even though they were the same communities, the context isn't the same at all. Their communities have changed dramatically with population growth, blossoming economic centers and development technology, social media, and the influence of the younger generations, it's changing things in every part of our lives. Now, we're good engineers, but to be better engineers, we need people who live in the communities to participate and contribute in the process. It was a little uncomfortable, 
But when we allowed that to happen, it developed better projects that improve communities that will stand the test of time. These will be places that people want to live and raise their families. I'm going to offer you a model to use when you're up against an issue that is obviously complicated, or even when you thought it was simple, only to find out, well, it's not that simple. The only person whoever, will, whoever says a challenge is easy is a person who's never done it before. Now, of course, there's not a one-size-fit-all answer to every possibility. And I would suggest that there are four steps that applied broadly wherever you're working, when, when you're working towards a solution. The way you apply the steps will be a little different depending on the context. But I believe these principles work and you can apply them in everything we do. So let me just talk about these. The first step is really borrowed from, I like to think, Stephen Covey and you know, his book, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, Great Utah. Um, to seek first to understand. Now, during this first step, you aren't telling and explaining, you're listening and learning. You're asking what questions? Like, what is your dream for your community? What does your dream look like? What do you want to have happen? And then you listen, not with the idea of responding, but with the idea of really understanding what they're trying to say. Second, defining. This is really defining the core needs. For example, I mentioned earlier that Utah is all about moving people, not vehicles. Can you see what a difference that one dimensional shift makes in determining solutions? During this step, you'll be asking why questions. Why, why, why? Just like your kids. In fact, you may want to try a technique called the five whys, which was first created as a way to help improve business processes. The idea is to ask the question why five times. I know it sounds annoying. However, this will help you get to the core need. You almost always need to come down to it. It will almost always need to come down to quality of life in one way or another. You may not even need to ask the question five times before things such as values of health, happiness, connectedness start to emerge. So once you get to that why, now you need to help define that core need. It's, start, it's time to start doing the fun stuff, designing solutions, which is the third step. This is when you start asking yourself the how questions. The goal for this step is to come up with as many ideas as possible as quickly as you can. Really push yourself here. Set a goal, 50, 75, 100 ideas. I know that sounds crazy, but trust me, you'll start to get really creative after the first 25 or so. And after you've had a long list of options, narrow it down to just a few of your best ideas. Then finally, the fourth step is you need to test the best ideas. Ask, will it work? Before you choose one solution and begin to act on it, test it to make sure it works. That was really quick, those four steps um, on how we try to build the community of our dreams in the state of Utah. It's a what, why, how, and will it work approach. And it doesn't really matter if your mission has anything to do with community of your dreams or if it's something else. This approach is founded on solid values and principles and can help you find the right way when you're unsure of what direction to go. Now, I hope it will give you some thoughts on how you might apply these steps as you, as you work as an engineer, wherever it may take you. Because what we do is so important, regardless of the field we're in. As engineers, I believe we're the luckiest people in the world because we have a chance to make a profound impact on the world. But it's also a little intimidating, especially when you think about how fast the world is changing because new technology is coming at such a rapid pace Globalization is changing the way we do business and how we connect with each other and the consequences of our changing climate. When I went to the University of Utah for my engineering degree, we were using this program called Fortran. Today, each one of us has more computing powers on our phones than the, that entire mainframe that we were using. Now, that's a pretty dramatic change in 40 years. And I'll guarantee you this, the next 40 years, you'll see even greater change at an even faster pace. That's gonna require you to stay committed to continuous learning throughout your entire career and life. It's okay to talk about old technologies from back in the day, and it may be a little scary to realize that for you, those obsolete technologies will probably be iPhones and early artificial intelligence. The important part is that you are still learning about technologies that are advancing around you and how they can help you in achieving your big goals. Technology is an incredible tool and the best thing about it is, 
that we gain new and better resources to do what matters most, making our world a better place than it is today. We talked about context and how important it is. As the world around us evolves, we are about to experience a change of context. And that is just one of the many context changes you can expect. Context is change, and you will adapt in order to su succeed. Context is change as your career takes twists and turns. Even when the world around you changes and the choices you make become more and more critical, remember that you are here because you want to improve the quality of life of everyone. We help to make modern life possible, and we've been doing it for generations, and we will continue to do it for many more. Now, the power of convening, of coming together, is to challenge ourselves to learn from everyone else. Seek out different perspectives. Sometimes we brag about our accomplishments, but the most important part of what we do when we come together is to learn from each other. And as you listen to other people, ask yourself, how can I help them be better? What can I offer? The power that sharing brings is amazing. When you help someone succeed, you'll find that there'll be 10 other people that want to help you be successful as well. So I want to thank the National Pavement Center for bringing us together. I want to thank you all for your time and thank you for your passion for creating a safe transportation system for the future. By doing so, you're creating the future of our country, our states, and the cities and towns in which you all live. And you are continuing a proud and distinguished history. Thank you very much. The preceding was produced by the National Center for Pavement Preservation. More information can be found on the web at pavementpreservation.org. Additional support provided by Michigan State University.